Special thanks to The Ridge for sponsoring this video. More on that later. If you want to get around Kerbin, one of the best options you have is to use a jet engine. Their good thrust combined with their high efficiency allows you to transport your Kerbals and or payloads for thousands of kilometers. There's quite a few options for jet engines in KSP. On the low end, you have jet engines like the Juno and Weasley, which offer great efficiency but are limited to lower speed regimes. If you want to go fast, you have jet engines like the Panther, Whiplash, and Rapier, which can operate at higher Mach numbers, but at a lower efficiency overall. Of all these options though, the king of them is the Goliath engine. It is the only engine in the game with a 2.5 meter diameter form factor, and is the heaviest of them all at 4.5 tons. It's also the most efficient engine in the game, with a ridiculous ISP of 12,600 seconds. That's over three times higher than the Ion engine. It even comes with its own massive intake to supply its insane air consumption. Much like the high bypass turbofans of real life, this is clearly an engine intended for cruising long distances. Now this got me thinking, how far can we go with this jet engine? What's the maximum range we can achieve with a Goliath powered craft? Now you'd think the obvious solution would be to load this up with as much fuel as it can lift and then fly it. If you did this, you'd get a good range, but it wouldn't be optimal. Let me explain. The range of an aircraft does not just depend on the amount of fuel you can lift off with. It also depends on your velocity. To illustrate this, I built these two planes here. The only difference between them is their cruising speed. This plane has opted for fewer engines and more wing area to cruise at subsonic speeds, while the other plane has more engines and less wing area to cruise at supersonic speeds. I cheated these planes up to 2 kilometers and then boosted them up to their cruising velocity so you could compare. While the slower plane is burning less fuel, it's also traveling slower. From the fuel consumption, you can see it's burning about 0.05 units of fuel per second and traveling between 200 to 250 meters per second. The supersonic plane, by contrast, is consuming double that at 0.1 units per second. However, it's also traveling much faster, at around 700 meters per second. If you do the math on how far both will go on 50 units of fuel using these rates, you'll find that the supersonic plane will actually travel significantly further. The supersonic plane will burn its 50 unit fuel load in about 500 seconds, which means that at a velocity of 700 meters per second, it will travel 350 kilometers. The subsonic plane will burn its 50 units in 1000 seconds, which gives it a range of 250 kilometers. You can see this in the test too, the subsonic plane landed in the ocean, while the supersonic one made it further to this peninsula east of the KSC. When you consider that adding more fuel has severe diminishing returns in terms of delta V, it turns out that it's a lot better to include less fuel and fly faster so you can be more efficient with the fuel you have. Okay, so hopefully I've convinced you that flying faster is a good idea if we want to get the maximum range out of this aircraft. So, going back to the Goliath engine, what exactly can we do with this engine? Well, looking at the stats, it's kinda insane. Just take a look at this graph of thrust versus Mach number. You can see that the Goliath continues producing thrust all the way up to just over Mach 2, even more silly is that it's producing more thrust in the supersonic regime, and on top of this, it's not losing any efficiency in the process of going this fast. Needless to say, the performance of this engine is completely unrealistic. But that's part of what makes this fun. So, armed with this knowledge, I set out to build a maximum range Goliath craft. And here's what I came up with. Introducing the Atlas. It's powered by a single Goliath engine and has a mass of 130 tons, 107 tons of which are liquid fuel. It's also made of 1,250 parts. You'll see why later. The pilot for this mission will be one of my patrons, Perky. Let's get him on board and let's fire this thing up. Buckle up, Captain Perky. This is going to be a long flight. As we wait for the jet engine to spool up, let's briefly go over the structure of this aircraft. 
Since we plan to fly fast, this aircraft has been heavily optimized to reduce drag. The main body of the craft is composed of a fairing, which shields the over 400 Mark Zero fuel tanks inside. I chose these fuel tanks because they have the best fuel to dry mass ratio in the game, which in turn gives us some more delta V. Furthermore, since they're so small, I could pack more fuel into the same volume of fairing without clipping the tanks. The fairing also shields the Goliath engine, which would otherwise create a ton of drag. However, when we do this, we also lose the air intake on the Goliath. To make up for that, I have just one shock cone at the front to feed it. You'd think this wouldn't be enough, but actually as we gain speed, this shock cone will be more than enough to supply the air consumption of the engine. While I've done as much as I can to reduce the drag, the fairing itself is still a huge problem. It produces a large amount of drag if it has any angle of attack to the airstream so I need to keep it pointing directly prograde. To accomplish this, I've added a 4 degree deflection to the wings so that they can still produce lift while the craft is pointing prograde. And for the flight, I'm using MechJeb's Smart ASS to hold its orientation. By doing all this, I can achieve a lift to drag ratio of 4.9, which is very good for the supersonic regime. The slow acceleration is part of why we need to take off from the South Pole. The other reason we need such a long takeoff run is the absurd speed we need to reach to take off. This aircraft has so little wing area and so much mass that it can't even fly subsonic, so we actually need to get up to supersonic speeds first before we can take off. And of course, this is going to take a lot of distance. After about 12 minutes of burning, we have reached a velocity of 587 meters per second, which is just barely enough for us to start lifting up. And just in time too, we've also run out of ice sheet. To keep track of the mission, I'll add this mini map in the bottom right here. This map was animated using the latitude longitude points recorded during the flight. These same latitude longitude points are also what I'm using to calculate the total distance traveled since KSP's F3 menu really can't be trusted to give me an accurate distance measurement. You'll notice that I'm flying really close to sea level. I'm doing this for a few reasons. For one, flying at sea level reduces the wing area I need, which in turn allows me to carry more fuel to go even further. Another big reason is that the speed of sound is higher at sea level than at higher altitudes. This is very important since the thrust, lift, and drag all depend on the speed of sound. As a result, when the speed of sound is higher, I can fly faster for the same fuel consumption, which is obviously good for maximum range. There is a problem with flying at sea level though. Mountains. It turns out that KSP has a lot of land mass, and a lot of mountainous landmass at that. As a result, most sea level paths will end in a mountain range, especially those near the equator. To solve this, I wrote a program that takes in an image of Kerbin's height map, and then searches every possible straight line path on Kerbin to find the lowest altitude one. As a bit of terminology here, this kind of straight line path on a sphere is known as a geodesic or great circle. After running my admittedly pretty horribly inefficient program, it found this path here. This beauty avoids this massive mountain range here and follows an almost entirely sea level course. The minimum safe altitude for this path is actually less than 500 meters. While it looks wavy, that's only because I have it on an equirectangular projection here. When mapped to a sphere, this is in fact a geodesic, and you can see that in the marker probes I placed down to help me follow it. As we continue on our path, there's another problem sneaking up on us. The heat. Since the Goliath has this insane efficiency and thrust in the supersonic regime, I guess the devs decided to balance it by making the Goliath output a nuclear reactor's worth of heat. I'm not even exaggerating here. At the speed we're at, the engine is outputting almost 400 megawatts of heat, which is similar to the thermal output of a naval nuclear reactor. Yeah, running this without cooling would quickly overheat the engine. 
Fortunately, we have two cooling solutions to help keep the temperatures down. The first solution was attaching all the fuel tanks to the engine. This allows the heat from the engine to sink into the fuel tanks, which helps us handle the high initial heat load from flying at sea level. However, since the fuel tanks are inside a fairing, they can't radiate or convect this heat anywhere, so they'll slowly overheat as well. This is where my second solution comes in. Attached to the engine are 810 3.75 meter flags, which have a total mass of 3.24 tons. This combined total of flags can radiate just enough heat away to keep the engine below its failure point of 2000 Kelvin. While this is a lot of extra dry mass compared to running this engine at subsonic speeds, my testing revealed that it was still worth it to go supersonic, even with the extra mass of flags. In terms of aesthetics, I actually really like this high latitude path. It is mostly ocean, but it does fly by these scenic mountains in the north. That said, this path isn't perfect. Since we are traveling through such a high range of latitudes, we're experiencing a relatively large Coriolis force, and I'm having to constantly correct for that with a roll input over the flight. On top of this, the speed of sound is lower at high latitudes, since the air is colder, which of course is hurting our velocity. We don't want to stay on this path for longer than necessary, so once we drain enough fuel and gain enough altitude, we're going to switch over to an equatorial path. Well, I think I've covered just about everything I wanted to with this design. One last thing I want to mention though. In the video title, I said this was capable of 10 plus circumnavigations. But I never said how many exactly. If you'd like, feel free to guess how far it will travel in the comments below. And with that, I think I'll shut up for now and let you enjoy the music. See what engine flame out.
We have now run out of fuel. Now let's just glide the rest of the way. Ah, mm, that was a bit too fast. Fortunately, we do have a quick save that we can fall back on. Let's do this again. And there we have it, a water landing. We're just going to wait for this to slow down and... Uh, wait, what? what is this? Huh. We have a strange case of bouncy water. And it's not slowing down. In fact, it's actually speeding up. Huh. Well, this isn't so good. It's going to take hours for this to reach the shore at this rate, so landing attempt number three. This time I'm landing to approach the shore so that I can hopefully beach this thing and stop it. We're just going to reach the shoreline and... Uh, hmm. Darn, again. Looks like the nose cone hit the shore too hard and it's actually bounced off and it's going to keep going. Alright, alright, alright. Fourth time's the charm. This time, I'm landing in a lake that has a shallow shore coming up. Hopefully, it will just bounce over there and come to a stop. And yes, that's done the trick, finally. After flying for 34 hours, and traveling 73,300 kilometers, we have finally touched the ground again. This distance, by the way, corresponds to over 19 circumnavigations of Kerbin. In total, this took me about 21 hours to record, even with 4 times time acceleration speeding things up. Thank you for watching. I had a lot of fun with this one. I think this is the most time I've spent into optimizing an aircraft, and I certainly learned a lot in the process. I'm looking forward to doing more crazy things with aircraft in the future, now that I have a better understanding of how to optimize for them. I also want to give a huge thanks to The Ridge for sponsoring this video. You know, the holidays are starting to come around, and I bet some of you are still looking for the perfect gift to give. If that describes you, consider giving the gift of a Ridge wallet this Christmas. Everyone has an old wallet that they've used forever, and no one thinks to get themselves a new one. You could make the Ridge their new wallet. The Ridge wallet is a lightweight, space-efficient alternative to the bulky wallets of the past. It has room for up to 12 cards plus cash. You have a selection of 30 colors and styles, including carbon fiber, which I have here, and burnt titanium. It is made of durable materials that are guaranteed to last. The Ridge team stands behind their product and offer a lifetime warranty. The Ridge team is so confident that you'll like it in fact, they will let you try it for 45 days, and if you aren't satisfied, you can send it back for a full refund. So still looking for the perfect gift? 40,000 5 star reviewers can't be wrong. Whether it's a gift or for yourself, you can't go wrong with something built right. If you're interested, get 10% off today with free worldwide shipping and returns by going to ridge.com slash s75. That's ridge.com slash s75 and use the code s75. Link in the description. Again, thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.